May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I have to begin this morning by admitting there is always some struggle in the service that we are to undertake today. The baptism of children, especially younger children, has long been contentious, both in our churches and many others. We wonder how we can welcome a person into the church who cannot know what they are being welcomed into. And then we distract ourselves a little bit from what we are doing. We become enthralled by the cuteness of the moment, how well or not well the child deals with the events, whether they cry or whether they smile. And having baptised my own daughter last week, I very much fell into this trap. (laughs) These are all good things. They are all wonderful things. But they are not the thing that we are here for today. And they start to make us wonder, especially those of us who are called to lead the church, whether we should do it at all. Despite all the arguments, however, we finally come around to saying yes to the baptism of children. Why? Because of one word. Grace. Because God has said yes to us. God's grace triumphs human indiscipline and gratitude and difference and a whole lot worse here's the basic deal god is love the eternal love of father son and spirit a dynamic dancing daring love that bubbles up and overflows god just cannot contain god's self and cascades into creation in god's love god created a cosmos Seeds it with galaxy, illuminates it with stars, sprinkles it with planets, and populates one of them with wonderful creatures, and eventually with human beings. So far, so good. But what do we do, we human beings? We screw up. That's what we do. From little goofs to major mayhem, we screw up. As far back as the historical and archaeological record takes us, we screw up. And we know it. This human brokenness deep inside and from personal experience, we know that what we will and what we do, me as I am and me as I should be, they are never consistently aligned. We don't only screw up, of course. We get some things right. We make love, we write poetry, we play music, we cure diseases, we create the game of football. And from the trivialization of everyday life, we work our way up to the tragic and the terrible. We practice the dark arts of mendacity, of fear and hatred and war, and with a toxic combination of insatiable consumption and technological genius, we are now painting ourselves into the corner of ecological meltdown. We take this beautiful blue planet, we colonize it, we plunder it, we turn it into a killing field and prepare it for extinction. Welcome to the world. (laughs) But yes, grace, God's grace, a grace that speaks of life, not of death, for God hates death, hates it. And because God loves us, loves us unconditionally, and I mean really unconditionally, so that whatever we do cannot make God love us any more or any less, can whatever we do or our children do make them love us or love them more or less? God will not leave us in death. We will all die, of course. Even the earth itself will become, one day become a burnt-out cinder. But because God is love, all the way down because God in his love is never reactive always proactive God will not leave it at that God has big plans for creation his work in progress is a new creation and nothing less than that is what we declare today in baptism be absolutely clear today is not just some family occasion or domestic do Baptism is an act of incorporation into the church, but it is more than that too. It is nothing less than a reenactment of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which itself marks the end of the world as we know it, the world that ends in death, and initiates a new world, a new kind of life 
in which the Bible gestures with the phrase eternal life which suggests a quality of human flourishing which is our heart's deepest desire and wildest dream. In baptism, we participate in the death and resurrection of Christ himself. He dies, we die with him. He rises, we rise with him. At these baptisms, if we really had eyes to see and ears to hear, we would hear mighty trumpets and angelic choirs and see the sky roll up like a scroll. When the water falls off their heads, we will clutch the pew in front of us, expecting the building to rock and roll. When the name of the Trinity is pronounced, we will think, here come the dead, rising from their graves, jumping and hollering and two-stepping into heaven. And when we present these children, as they go up or down the aisle, we will think that every woman who has ever longed for motherhood would suddenly know it. No miraculously, she was with child. And we would envision every child who has ever lived laughing and playing in the perfect park. And when the sun sets and it's time to go home, they discover that their houses are made of gingerbread. So another baptism and another world. Shortly, we will go back to the world of Wellington and of Wall Street and of the warehouse, or Kmart, I should say now, bewitched by the deities of power, wealth, fame, and status. But for a short while this Sunday morning here at this place, you will have been brought by the celebration of these baptisms into a strange place called the kingdom of God, where a whole new world has been disclosed to you. A world which, unbeknownst to most people, happens to be the real world. May you take that holy experience with you. Recall it often. Use it to get your head straight and your heart right. That touched by grace and knowing God here just a little, you may know him there even more and ever better. Amen.